All right, everyone. Um, we're back, and um, let's welcome our last speaker for this symposium. Um, he's Mantong. He's um, one of our national squash squash athlete, and also our uh, junior squash teams coach. So Mantong was graduated from um, NTU Sports Science and Management Program. Um, he was also uh, complete. He, he also completed his internship with um, SSI under the physiology team. And uh, he's extremely keen in pursuing excellence, not just in his sport, but also academically, um, especially in the field of exercise physiology. He has been granted the privilege to pursue his PhD studies in 2021 through the NTU Research Scholarship and intend to continually contribute to Singapore's sporting ecosystem. Uh, Mantong has been a great example of why employers should employ ex-athlete. He's hardworking and he's always um, interested to find out more and um, to help the athletes. So uh, it is a privilege for us to be working together. And Mantong, I'm um, handing over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Mantong. So today I'll be sharing with you. Let me share my screen first. Uh, hold on. Huh? Okay. All right. Uh, yep. So then you can check is is all right. Uh, the screen sharing. Okay. So today I'll be presenting to you. Um. So we just now we heard uh from Dr. Raymond about like the organizational aspect of uh controlling COVID nineteen during uh uh this pandemic situation. So now I'll be talking to uh regarding uh how our national athletes and coaches have coped with our circuit breaker, which is our stay at home order. Yeah. So I'm Martin from the sport uh, physiology, physiology department from SSI. And I would like to firstly acknowledge like all the hard work that has been put into this survey from the physiology team, as well as the other team leads from uh, yep. So let's begin. All right, so give you to give you some context. So for overseas uh, viewers, so circuit breaker is our version of our lockdown. Right. So in on April 3rd, there was the announcement of the circuit breaker. And four days after, there was a commencement of the service. It was a commencement of circuit breaker, and it was only uh, halted on June first. So, what does this mean for uh, our community and for our athletes? So, they could only uh, exercise at home uh, as much as possible, and if they, they were to want to exercise outdoor to do uh, activities like walking, running, or cycling, uh, they only can do it in their immediate neighborhoods. So this was very controlled. If you make, if you break any flout any of the rules, you'll be fine. Yeah. So what uh then what does it mean for our athletes who are going for the Olympic Games or who, who have like tournaments coming up in the near future? All right. So uh as we can see, the IOC announced that the Olympic Games to be postponed to twenty twenty one. Right. So um yeah. So the schedules, training schedules were also likewise affected, and. Yeah, even for those athletes who are not involved in Olympic Games, I think many of their big tournaments were also postponed to a later date and indefinitely. So then the big question is, how did our national athletes and coaches cope with the circuit breaker? So this is uh, the, so these are the objectives of the survey. Firstly, to examine the perception of how our athletes and coaches uh, deal with training, nutrition, and mental well-being during circuit breaker. Uh, and we are also we also want to evaluate the survey results to continually develop a more robust sports science support system so that we can deal with this kind of situations uh in the future more efficiently but hopefully not yeah and uh lastly our sports scientists can then follow up more effectively with their sports post circuit breakup so how this was done is that uh we targeted athletes and coaches from uh, selected sports and it was done through a google survey form distributed uh mid-may and it was terminated end of June. So uh, if you like like to examine the questions here, here's a QR code as well as the tiny URL which you can access. Yeah, I'll give you guys about uh, 20 seconds if you like to take a look at the questions. Uh, 
Okay. So moving on, uh, we have the topic questions. So within the athlete survey, mainly five uh, components, uh, looking at injury status, their perceived changes in their physical conditioning and fitness levels, uh, their ge the general perception of home-based training, as well as mental well-being and nutritional experience. For the coaches side, just two main categories, their perceived changes in the athletes, physical conditioning and fitness levels, as well as their general perception of home-based training. There are also uh, other coach specific questions within the survey itself. So here are the demographics. So total 198 athletes from 20 sports, 68 coaches from 18 sports responded. And it was around, they responded at around seven and a half weeks into circuit breaker. So if we look at uh, the table here, uh, we can see that about 70% of uh, the athletes are in the senior category, meaning above 19 years old. And most of them are uh, competing at Asian games or, or above at international level. So about the coaches. So do take note that uh, these coaches may not be the ones who coach the athletes who responded. All right. So yeah, the, the athletes are mostly uh, adult athletes and some even coach both youth and adult athletes. Um, yeah, athletes are also competing at an Asian games or higher level. So if we look at the sport involvement, okay, we look at this graph here. Uh, we can see that some sports may be over overrepresented. For example, on the athlete side, uh, bowling, swimming, as well as table tennis, and the coaches side, uh, badminton, bowling, swimming, and table tennis. So these are the sports involved in this survey. So without much further ado, let's go into the main findings and recommendations. So just there are four key areas. So firstly, we like to address uh, concerns over quality of training and sport performance as the athletes and coaches transit to home-based training. Secondly, mental well-being and nutritional experience of athletes. Thirdly, the limited access to sports facilities and limited training equipment. As well as lastly, uh, the Institute's effectiveness in supporting athletes and coaches. So the first uh, big key area, which is training sport performance and self-reported injuries. So if we take a look, uh, so it's by no doubt that um, yeah, it's a concern that we can't keep up our training during home-based training. So this is a main question we ask, what are your biggest concerns regarding training during this period? Yeah, so as you can see, uh, most of athletes and coaches highlighted that uh, they were afraid of a decreased fitness. They felt that uh, there, there are definitely limited technical practice, meaning uh, sport specific training by itself, and as well as a lack of training volume and density. So this comes the first issue, uh, decrease in frequency of training, duration, and volume of technical and high intensity sessions. So we look at this graph here. Okay, on the y-axis, we have the percentage of respondents. Yeah, and uh, on the x-axis, we have uh, training frequency and duration. So if we look at, uh, on the left side, there's the big decrease in training frequency. So about 40 plus percentage of the respondents uh, felt that they trained lesser during this period of, uh, fewer times during this period of circuit breaker. And if you look at training duration as well, almost 80% of them felt that their training duration was cut down. Yep. So we take a look, now we take a look at uh, number of technical sessions and non-technical sessions. So as um, obviously without facilities, without uh, sport specific equipment, uh, there's a big decrease in the number of technical sessions. So meaning like badminton players, they can't do their normal badminton training uh, sessions. Uh, for table tennis players, they can't play table tennis with another, for example, with another player. Yeah, so this causes the big, big, big decrease in technical sessions. This was, however, not compensated as much uh, in the non-technical session. So we would expect that they increase their strength and conditioning sessions or other sessions related, related to their sport. But oh, there was only like only 50% of them managed to increase the non-technical sessions. So uh, now we investigate the number of like sessions based on intensity. So as we can see, right, there's a, actually a huge decrease in the number of high intensity sessions. So if, if like, uh, let's say athletes, they want to maintain a training load. Training load is the interaction between intensity, frequency, and duration. So if they want to maintain this training load, right, when training frequency and 
duration decreases, we should actually compensate with uh, increase in intensity. But however, it's also seen that intensity is being uh, very much reduced. Therefore, we can actually speculate that, uh, conclude that there's a decrease in training load. So then we ask uh, the athletes who prescribed your training. So they responded that majority of them, uh, majority of the training programs were prescribed by coaches as well as uh, the scientists, the sports scientists. Right. So we asked the coaches, given the sudden announcement of circuit breaker, did you have sufficient time to adapt, plan, and implement these training programs? Uh, yep. And surprisingly, right, 40, about 40% 40 of them responded, yep, no, they didn't have enough time to like adapt and plan the, the training programs for their athletes. So we can actually take away that this decrease in training load may actually be due to firstly, uh, insufficient equipment, there's no facility, uh, you can't access facility, and there may be lack of time to plan from the coach's side. However, uh, conversely, right, we do not know whether it's actually the intention of coaches to reduce training load, uh, in which if we look at it in a, in a, in a long-term perspective, the tournaments are being postponed indefinitely. We don't know when uh, tournaments will resume. So it may be actually a, bad, a good time for athletes to really just rest and recover, take it as a taper period, uh, yeah, where yeah, then just rest and recover and maybe actually beneficial for them in the long run. However, do note that if these uh, declines in training load, right, are not properly planned, it may ultimately cause a decline in their sport performance. Uh, therefore, the interaction between the three factors as mentioned previously, the duration, frequency, and intensity of training should be manipulated accordingly towards the goals of the coaches and the athletes. So before I give uh, provide some recommendations, I think uh, Rico also mentioned this previously that we're whooping 14.2% of athletes who are injury-free and injured previously but able to train were found to have uh, sustained an injury uh, during the circuit breaker period. So it's actually rather surprising because if you would think about it, if you are training at home, home is rather a safer environment. So why would athletes be uh, found to have sustained an injury? So we speculate that, uh, yep, as Rico also mentioned previously, the use of other training modalities. So swimmers being in the pool, the whole, almost for all, most of their sessions, they are, they are required to do more dry land training, like for example, running to maintain the same amount of training load. They, are, they may actually work muscles, which they do not uh, have not worked much before and may cause a higher risk of injury. So as they transit to this kind uh, of like new, rather relatively new modes of activity, uh, coaches and they shouldn't be too concerned with their training load, but rather uh, manage how to progressively increase the intensity and duration of their workout. For example, doing uh, more high intensity runnings, doing more slow in low intensity running and then progressively high intensity. Yeah. yeah. So with that said, our goal of training should be shifted. It should, shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be used to train more, but rather is to provide a platform for uh, athletes to return to sports safely. Uh, it's also a platform for reduction of incidents of injuries during, during and post circuit breaker. And lastly, then to minimize the effects of the training. So if you look at this uh, rainbow spectrum, there's a two spectrum of the training and over training. So we have to try, try to strike a balance between uh, the training as well as over training while also uh, Okay, think the athletes injury free. So, what do we propose? We propose that uh, rehabilitation should be considered as a first top priority, right? So, for athletes who are injured, are uh, currently injured, or who have been injured before, I think yeah, most athletes experience this. It's actually a good time to really just step away from their usual sport specific training, take it as time to recuperate, uh, address areas of muscle weakness, imbalances, and uh, come back stronger than before. And for athletes who are still healthy, uh, they can take this time to likewise strengthen themselves uh, and come back post circuit breaker uh, even stronger. And yeah, so moving on to the next point, yeah, is interlinked with the first one. So we have to minimize the in, uh, incidence of injuries also, we have to uh, conservatively prescribe our training. So we got, like using the uh, example as before, Swimmer, if you want to progress, uh, you want to use running or cycling as a training mode, how should you then 
progressively increase in density and frequency. So this must be prescribed by the scientists or coaches carefully. And lastly, uh, we can also use complementary training methods. So these training methods are to actually provide a variety and to address uh, neglected areas of training. Uh, yeah, I will dis be discussing this uh, later in the presentation. All right, so here comes the key area number two, which is mental well-being and nutritional experience. So being is uh, by no surprise. I mean, many research have shown that like uh, being cooped up at home in a lockdown has uh, caused many psych uh, psychological negative psychological feelings uh, from not just athletes, but also uh, just by the general public. So, I mean, athletes are not spared. So imagine they have to, they are, they are, the competition stimulus have been taken away from them. Uh, there's a lack of interaction with uh, their peers, their athletes, their, their, their competitors, as well as their coaches. How would they feel? So we actually asked them uh, this question over the last two weeks. How often have they been bothered by the following feelings? So these are some of the negative feelings. And I would say it's rather uh, surprising that uh, about 40 plus percent or more have actually felt some form of negative uh, feelings. So yeah, with worry, worrying too much about different things as well as becoming easily annoyed or irritable being two of the most felt emotions. Okay, so this is issue three. So as athletes step away from actual training, actual with, from competitions, they will feel a sense of loss. They may feel very empty. They might feel worthless. They may feel anxious and they might even feel grief. So how do we overcome this is that we have to try uh, to get them to maintain both positive uh, mental health state as well as a physical well-being as they are very uh, uncertain about not just their sport, but life in general. Okay, some proposed recommendations. Firstly, we can take away um, their focus on their usual training routine to include that of more sports psychology based training. So for example, they can renew their goal, they can have a goal setting session to really sit down and reflect about uh, their past and what they are going to do in the future. They can uh, look at uh, visualization, mental imagery. Uh, they can look at video analysis, right? To look and what they can do in the future. Yeah. So this comes with uh, mental skills training uh, and it can be provided uh, through the use of educational videos and with uh, our sport psychologists connecting with them and guiding them through uh, different kinds of uh, psychology based training methods. Uh, secondly, uh, also for travel athletes, they can have uh, we can have an athlete's mental well-being support hotline where they can call and talk to any certified uh, sport uh, psychologists uh, or counselors to about their problems at home. Yep. And lastly, besides uh, uh, just doing their normal training, they can try and improve sports science knowledge in general. For example, looking at uh, how to maximize their training, uh, how to do a uh, video analysis for their own uh, sport and maybe look at th top professionals how do they perform their skills and hopefully take some notes learn from it and when they come back to uh, training post circuit breaker they'll be renewed they'll be refreshed they'll be motivated to tackle the challenges ahead yeah so going into nutrition uh, on we asked them this question on a scale of one to ten how positive has your nutritional or food experience uh, been during circuit breaker? So one being a very difficult food experience, ten being very positive. All right. So thankfully, uh, yeah, most of them felt that it was rather good uh, nutritional experience for them. Uh, however, it's to note that when we ask uh, if they would like help from a sport dietitian to better plan how to manage their nutrition, most of them uh, replied yes. I mean, it would be beneficial for them. To learn more about uh, managing their nutrition during like periods like in the lockdown where i mean they are given more opportunity to uh, cook their own meals prepare their own meals and even uh, try other food outside yeah okay so some uh questions uh this was not in the survey but it was something it was a feedback by our nutritional uh, team lead uh, dr rico so they 
he mentioned that there's a high demand for nutritional content that address uh, immunity and body composition. So I think this is uh, very important in especially in athletes. So body immunity to stay strong even though they are even though when they are training hard, uh, how to maintain a good uh, immune immune system and for body composition mostly for uh, like aesthetic sports uh, who with athletes being very concerned about yeah what to eat to sort of like have a best composition while also not feeling tired when they are training. So some recommendations include, uh, firstly, uh, this, this, this uh, recommendation is already in the pipeline. So there's an e-nutritional booklet uh, being uh, done with a cookbook and videos within it, embedded in it. So they will address like uh, content regarding, uh, like content regarding key nutritional messages, like how, uh, what vitamins to eat, how, how we can, uh, what fruits and vegetables provide what kinds of antioxidants, how to time your carbohydrates and proteins around training, and also how to like prepare easy uh, but yet very nutritious di uh, dish dishes. Yeah. Secondly, we also have the S Active SG Circle, which is a virtual sports center, and also a sports science repository within it. So uh, at general public as well as athletes can access this uh, Active SG Circle to gain more information regarding sports science and sport nutrition. So please take a look if you are interested. All right, moving on to key area number three. So besides uh, decrease in training volume, I think most of the athletes and coaches were very concerned uh, with the lack of the facilities and equipment to train. So uh, these environmental factors include firstly, the inability for athletes to train with the team. So there's, there isn't that competitive stimulus, there isn't that social interaction anymore. There's also lack of supervision uh, by the coaches. And secondly, also lack of equipment. So with, without equipment, I mean, how can athletes who need the equipment train, right? Yeah. So we asked them a few questions. So firstly, is there sufficient equipment to maintain the quality of training? And uh, most of them replied, uh, no. There were not. Yeah. So we also asked them. So what do you think is the most important or needed equipment? So most of them answered general gym equipment as well as sports specific equipment. So if I break down general gym equipment, it will be like uh weights, uh dumbbells, barbells, uh even resistance bands. Yeah, or even any gym specific equipment. And for sports specific equipment includes uh things like for example uh table tennis players they would like a uh, table. Table tennis table for maybe bowlers, they require a bowl, bowling pin and a, bowling pins and the ball, yeah, to practice. All right. So here comes issue four, inadequate sporting facilities and equipment. So it's not that we did not loan any equipment. We did loan uh quite a bit of equipment to our physiology team. We loan out um cycling ergometers, the walk bike to our badminton athletes, to uh sila athletes, even the kayak and canoe ergometers, the kayak and rowing ergometers to the kayakers and rowers. And the SNC department also loaned out quite a bit of uh, weights, uh, dumbbells, barbells, etc. Et to a lot of athletes. However, it is high, should be highlighted that it is impossible to ensure every athlete has sufficient equipment for home-based training. Therefore, uh, there will be an, there's an urgency to actually implement solutions towards the loading of equipment to NSAs in the event of a future circuit breaker. So we can't definitely can't ensure that we can loan all the NSAs and their athletes uh, uh, equipment for them to train at home. So what should we do? So firstly, we should we can provide recommendations for individual NSAs to be more self-sufficient. So firstly recommend them like uh, what kinds of portable resistance equipment is necessary and is good uh, for home-based training. Uh, secondly, uh, we should also outline a plan in how to facilitate our loaning of equipment. So firstly, uh, let's say we only have like four days of a, there's, there's only four days period between the announcement and amendment of circuit breaker majors. How, how do we uh, loan our equipment very in a timely manner and how do we prioritize the allocation? So we would like to think that, uh, no, we would like to prioritize like for Olympic Games at least they get the most priority. So we would definitely give the best equipment we could to the Olympic Games athletes followed by Asian Games and uh, regional games athletes. So, another third point, uh, for key athletes training for Olympic Games, 
uh, they can be housed in tra temporary training facilities like the Singapore Sports School. So in the Singapore Sports School, for example, using the swimmer as an example, they can continue uh, doing their SNC training in the gym while also using the pool to do their uh, swimming swim training. Yeah, and they will be sort of like in a uh, isolated training facility where they will be uh, they won't be com interacting with the uh, community. So this will provide them continuous training towards uh, their major games. So moving on to the fourth key area uh, is SSI's effectiveness in supporting athletes and coaches. So thankfully, uh, majority of the athletes and coaches uh, responded that, uh, yep, we were quite effective in our support. However, uh, some suggestions from them include that they would like to learn more about sports science content, as well as uh, they would like more communication between uh, athletes and sports scientists. And lastly, uh, coaches uh, would like to have uh, more advice and plans for similar situations. Right, so this is uh, issue five. Yep. So high responses requesting for more sports science resources and contact time. Despite the various initiatives rolled out from SSI, which uh, uh, Dr. Rico um, mentioned earlier, and we shall be covering a bit uh, following. So some topics in the survey response include, uh, I quote them, goal setting, mental skills training, nutrition help, physical preparation, inspiring videos, injury management, etc. All right, so let's go through what we have done during this uh, circuit breaker. So as uh, Rico mentioned just now, uh, is we had the where my circuit broke video series uh, where the aim was actually to get sports science to be contributed to the wider community. So that to demonstrate nimbleness in contributing to Sports Singapore's effort to scale up digital content distribution. And lastly, uh, we also involved Team SG athletes. For example, uh, in what the first, if not wrong, the first uh series we had uh our national badminton shuttle, uh, and the and so a Sila athlete in the subsequent videos, uh, world champion Nurul Suhaila, to actually encourage the public to continue working out, staying fit to boost their immune system, even though they are stuck at home or they can't exercise much outdoors. Yeah, and. It's very important for our athletes to continually uh, interact with the public as, I mean, the public look to look up to them as uh, role models. Yep. Uh, also, secondly, we also had our smart hour, which Rico mentioned just now. So it was a discussion of sports science topics between our sports scientists, our sport excellence scholars, and their coaches on Zoom meeting platform. So a total of six sessions, approximately two hours each, with 77 athletes and uh, maybe 100 coaches across 19 sports. Yeah, so 19 different sports. So they were grouped according to uh, the type of sport, like for example, skill based, aesthetic sports, racing sports, target sports. All right, moving on. The third initiative we had was uh, SNC videos by SNC team. So here we have uh, Danny, uh, who went through uh, sort of a, like a mini lecture on basic periodization for sports performance. Yeah, it's on YouTube, really available. So yeah, you guys can check it out. Yeah, so there were actually many videos uh, created by them. And there were also many access, uh, exercise library by Kelvin. Uh, so fourthly, we also had uh, our scientists continuous engagement with national coaches. So with uh, just now Rico mentioned, uh, let show you guys the video of the national water polo men's team. It's actually a good like, uh, summary of how the different divisions, the how the different teams come together to uh, support the national water polo men's team. Yeah. All right, so we actually, for this fourth key area, right, some key takeaway is that, firstly, uh, our content actually targeted at the top tier athletes as well as the community, but we lack, we didn't target all national athletes and coaches. So this could be something to look into in the future. And uh, we also have to address marketability and reach of our public content. So to get more views, more subscribers, so that our content out there uh, can, can be able to reach uh, a big audience in our community. All right, so how do we achieve this? Firstly, this is already underway. So it's a media task force who is carrying out this project, Triple W. So it's to get our SSI Sports Science page on multiple social media platforms like uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, right? 
and our sports science teams will then consistently develop uh, relevant content throughout the year so that uh, I mean not just our athletes coaches but the general public can uh, get, gain more insights uh, regarding our institute as well as uh, sports science related content so yeah so I already put, put up the names I mean the link links here you can take a look at the various uh, media pages and please subscribe and like yep, and follow if you haven't done so okay second secondly the smart hour can also include a wider range of audience uh not just uh our spec scholars and our, their coaches but include maybe a bigger group of audience and lastly i mean we all know that there are so much uh sports science related content on youtube on instagram so what we can do is we can repackage and summarize all this sports science content and then in to to make it more relevant to our local community, local context. So for example, in the COVID-19 situation, our restrictions of our lockdown may not be similar to that of other countries. So how do we, we then uh, take the, so not take like borrow the information and repackage it to make it more useful for our local community. All right. So uh, with all surveys that comes, there's definitely some limitations. So obviously we are unable to assess and quantify how much that that is uh, how much how how would how was the training load like for the athletes uh we didn't know how their physical fitness changed and we didn't uh, take keep track of their dietary intake intake right uh secondly it's it's definitely very difficult to ascertain responses to be of positive or negative impact so looking at the training load uh, example again so reduction in training load may not necessarily be a bad thing because it may give your know, athletes time to recuperate if you have athlete times to recover from previous injuries so we don't do not know for sure all right so uh yeah this is for the survey we'll now we look at the complementary training methods which i mentioned earlier all right so in this next few slides right i'll try to convince you why complementary training methods is also important so besides just for athletes going through their usual training routine sports specific training routine uh I mean, this lockdown, this stay at home order can give them, actually can give them a, a time to do something different, something which they have, uh, they may or may not have uh, done before, may be areas which they have neglected and areas of weaknesses which they can focus on uh, yeah, solely during circuit breaker, which may benefit them in the long run. Right, so the very first uh, training method we could possibly explore is the respiratory muscle training. Okay, so respiratory muscle training what is it right so if you think about it uh when we breathe we breathe in breathe in hard you actually can feel like our uh chest muscles expanding the intercostal muscles expanding right yeah so these are the muscles which actually are used when you breathe in and out so if you think about uh high intensity exercise our active limb muscles for example if you are, if you are doing uh swimming okay uh, the arms, you use your arms, your legs, these active limb muscles, right, require substrates like carbohydrates, uh, fats. Uh, they require oxygen, they require blood flow. So if your breathing muscles also require these resources, right, isn't, aren't they competing with each other for resources? Yep, so how do, if we train, uh, why don't you think about it? If we train our respiratory muscles uh, to be a bit, a little stronger, right, less resources will be taken away from their active limb muscles. So they can actually uh, work at work at higher intensities during their training. Or their high intensity have, can have a, a, high, a better performance as the respiratory muscles won't be competing as much as they would usually with their active limb muscles. All right, so uh, I would like to show you guys a video regarding um, respiratory mus uh, muscle training. All right, so here goes. We've all thought about lifting weights. We've all heard that resistance training helps and you, know, you lift weights, it makes you strong. Well, how do you lift weights for your lungs? Running on a treadmill isn't gonna do it. High intensity interval training, like sprinting until you wanna fall over, it does it a little bit, but it really doesn't change the resistance, the amount of pressure your lungs have to work. You wanna get strong muscles in your lungs? There's a biohack for that. It's called the power lung, and it's something that we carry on the Bulletproof store. Here's what it looks like when you use it. It's actually really, really hard to do that. 
what I just did was I worked on training my interstitials, on training all of the muscles involved in making your lungs pull air in and force air out. When you do this, even every couple days for just a few breaths, you improve your ability to raise your VO2 max. You actually feel better. This is used by pro athletes and it's used by professional singers and even people like me who spend an awful lot of time on stage or on camera. You all right, so like as uh, uh, this guy mentioned, uh, respiratory muscle training is like like using dumbbells for uh, your respiratory muscle. So uh, imagine you are low in, exhaling and inhaling from a small hole to a larger hole. So that takes a lot of effort and the resistance can be adjusted. So yeah, by training our respiratory muscles, what are then the effects all right, so we take a look at some literature regarding this training, this kind of training. All right, so for endurance performance, so respiratory muscle training actually improves a uh, 5,000 meter time trial as well as a six minute all out effort. What about intermittent exercise performance? So footballers were shown to actually improve their yo-yo recovery test uh, after six weeks of uh, in, uh, respiratory muscle training. So do note that actually these protocols are rather short, so it only requires uh, 30 uh, breath efforts uh, for two times a day. Yeah, and the improvement is quite uh, significant. So what about sports which require repetitive sprints? So there was uh, this study actually shows uh, improvement in their recovery time between bouts of repetitive sprint activity. So yeah, so I think it was about 10 about 10%. 10 uh, faster recovery time as compared to uh, the placebo group. Okay, so we all, besides uh, respiratory muscle training, right, uh, we all know that one athlete, that one athlete who doesn't do his flexibility training, who is very stiff, uh, who is uh, often neglects his flexibility training, he just doesn't want to stretch because it's too painful. But targeted flexibility and motility training has actually shown to actually improve uh, performance. So, uh, for example, if you look at uh, Handel's study, uh, the second one here, uh, that's after like I think six weeks of six weeks, two times a week of uh, contract relaxed stretching uh, on the hamstring muscles, there was actually in increased force production uh, in the hamstring. For Will in Wilson's study, uh, powerlifters who did uh, extensive uh, stretch, uh, like a mix of dynamic and static stretching, actually shown. Uh, enhance short stretch shortening cycle during a rebound, rebound uh, bench press movement. Yep. For Hunter and Marshall, uh, in various athletes, they actually got them to do uh, different kinds of training. So power training with stretch, stretching, and just uh, purely power training at all. Uh, just purely power training. So the one, the group with, which did uh, both power and power training as well as uh, Stretch, uh, flexibility training, they actually improve their vertical jump. All right. So here we can, here we see uh, Danny going through a mobility session with the divers and kayakers on, if I'm not wrong, the shoulders and the hips. Okay. So moving on, I think this is a big part of uh, many of our strength training programs uh, nowadays, right? But what if we do just specifically core muscle training? So there was a comparison uh, between two groups. So firstly, one with which done a six week program of uh, core muscle training and another group, which is the control group. So this was done on Polish national swimmers. And these are the effects of the six week of core exercises. So what core exercises did they, did they actually use? So they use flutter kicks, uh, ball, the physio ball trunk extension, single leg V ups, as well as a Russian twist. So at the start, uh, I think if I'm not wrong, is they did it for 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off, uh, and four sets, and progressively they added a bit more load, uh, yeah, to the exercises. So what are the effects? If you look at the circle area, uh, the to total time to cover 50 meters actually uh, significantly improved, yeah, as compared to the control group, which has only a, a non-significant effect, yeah. All right, so in conclusion, uh, yeah, so these are some uh, training methods which, which uh, we can explore during times of uh, 
knocked down where I mean your sport specific tra training is taken away from you due to the lack of facilities and equipment right so yeah uh, something which you can consider and it may have long lasting effect in the athletes, athletes uh, career in the future so in conclusion uh, for the whole survey given that the top priority during a pandemic is community safety so certain limitations regarding training uh, remains like the lack of facilities all right so we can actually so we actually see that uh, quality and quantity of training along with fitness levels were severely effect, or quite affected a uh, negative psychological impact of home-based training was observed in the men, uh, negative mental health of the athletes and lastly uh, given that competition schedules are postponed our training goals and training methods should be flexible and adaptable. So as mentioned previously, uh, for injured athletes, it may be a good time for them to rest and recuperate rather than uh, training even harder. And for athletes who have like uh, who have already had a long season of training, it may be actually a time to really just rest the body and taper off. All right, so I actually chance upon quite a few interesting uh, videos on, on how athletes have been training. I saw some uh, some athletes bench, uh, bench pressing their sofa, some doing uh, leg presses on, the, with, on their, their beds, their mattresses. But this was the one which caught my attention. All right, so I'll just end off with this video. Okay. how this uh, sport climber, Olympic sport climber, uh, use her house and maximize the use of her house to train, even though they are, they, he can't, she can't be at the uh, yeah, at a gym training, doing her normal uh, training. Yeah, so, I mean, there are many ways to go about doing things. So I would like to end with this uh, quote by a motivational speaker. So if you really want to do something, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. So even in these difficult circumstances, uh, our roles as uh, athletes, as sports scientists, as coaches are to continually try to adapt and still train effectively, uh, even with the various limitations in place. And sports science can really help to really benefit through, so sports science knowledge can actually help to benefit at, uh, athletes and uh, coaches in general to like sort of like come up with effective training programs, uh, even though there are like many limitations around. Yeah, and with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mantong, for your presentation and uh, interesting findings from the survey. Yeah, um, the whole SNC team could understand the, the, the difficulty of planning the program within a short period, home-based program within a short period for many of our athletes. Yeah, that was sure difficult. And uh, the, well, our, our gym was pretty much wiped out from loaning it to the athletes. Um, thank you for your, your presentation. I think there's one question. Um, we are due to time constraint. I'll leave it to you to answer it on the chat. Um, so uh, thank you, Mantong. And um, ladies and gentlemen, um, do take your time to um, do the survey, uh, sorry, feedback um, by um, uh, scanning the QR code, which will be flashed in the wall. So um, we'll take a short break, a few minutes break, and um, Rico will be back to moderate the, the next um, uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Manto. Thanks, everyone.